welcome to Psychedelic Healing. I'm your host, Sonia Cotto, CRNA or nurse anesthesiologist, uh, who also works with ketamine for mental health. I am honored to have Dr. John Giordano, my partner in business and also an expert in the treatment of addiction, mental health, and also the founder of the National Institute for Holistic Addiction Studies. He has authored three books and has contributed to over 79 medical peer-reviewed journals. As a recovering addict who's coming up on 39 years of recovery, congratulations, John. He has been treating, oh, you're welcome. He has been treating patients with psychedelics for over 20 years. And that is exactly why I have him here today with me. Um, He has been uh, transformative in my business and partnership. And he actually has a wealth of knowledge in another psychedelic, I don't know if you are familiar with, called Ibogaine. So please, please, John, can you tell us what Ibogaine is? Welcome, by the way. (laughs) Oh, thank you, Sonia. And, you know, I I love being partners with Sonia because she's a really true healer. She really cares about the patients. Unfortunately, the psychedelic business, I call it a business, unfortunately, it, uh, there are people that are bad actors that got into this business. And what they do is just bring people in and bring people out instead of doing integrative therapy and therapy sessions with them and really taking the time to really look and see how they respond to the medicine. Uh, and that's why I went partners with Sonia. I just wanted to bring that in, Sonia, because to me, we're helping God's kids. And that's really important to have healers like yourself and Julie Clark that you just had on. It's really important. And um, this medicine, ketamine, ibogaine, ayahuasca, psilocybin, all these medicines are so important to bring to the forefront of, of medicine with mental health and addiction. We're not looking at people comprehensively. And we're still not, even with the psychedelic medicines. Now, I always uh, tell people about if you want to do psychedelics, you need therapy. There's, this is not a magic bullet, okay? Uh, bottom line is you need to have integrative counseling and long-term therapy until you start unraveling all these behaviors and all of these old thought patterns and create new uh, neural connections in your brain. So that's really important. Well, getting to Ibogaine. Now, Ibogaine is a bush from West Africa. It was used by what is called the Weedy tribe. The Weedy tribe used this substance as a rite of passage. And what happened was there was this gentleman called Howard Lutzoff, who I happened to meet and spoke with years ago. Howard was a heroin addict. He used tremendous amount of heroin and he wanted to find a new high. So where did he go? He went to West Africa. He heard about Ibogaine. And he said, wow, I'm going to try this. And he did it. He woke up the next morning. He was detoxed. Now, I don't know if your your uh, people out there listening know it doesn't take 24 hours of detox or for heroin, especially a heavy user that's been using for 20 years. It usually takes anywhere from seven to nine and they, days, and they still have a lot of residual effects like post-acute withdrawal syndrome. So... He did it. Being a good addict, he said, hmm, I don't have any cravings. I'm detox. I can make money with this. So what he did was he opened up a treatment center. He's a good addict, you know. Us addicts were very uh, good at doing things like that. Anyway, he went to um, Panama and he opened up a treatment center. And he looked around and he met Dr. Deborah Mash. Now, Dr. Mash is the doctor that I worked with for over 20 years. She's one of the pioneers in Ibogaine medicine. And what happened was, you know, see, just because addicts stop using drugs and alcohol doesn't mean that their behaviors change. So it takes time to undevelop, redevelop, whatever you want to call it, to change that whole paradigm and create a more spiritual, holistic approach to life and wellness. Well, Deborah didn't, couldn't handle him anymore. So she went to the island of St. Kitts and opened up her home treatment center. And that's basically where her and I got together. 
She was looking for someone. It, it's a quick little story. Um, I read in the newspaper that this was the 1990s, that uh, this doctor was looking for people to try this uh, bush out, this substance out, this medicine from the jungle uh, for heroin addicts and for mental health issues. And I called her up. I said, no, I really like to try that because I was always into alternative treatments. I wanted to see what was new and the greatest and the best and to help people uh, with addiction and mental health. So you're already clean and, at that point. Uh, yeah, I was clean at that point. Okay. And so what happened was I had an outpatient program at that point. And she said, no, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I have enough people. And she hung up on me. <laughs> I said, okay. So six months later, I get a phone call. And it's this woman on the other end. And she goes, hi, this is Dr. Mash. I said, oh, I remember you. You're the one that hung up on me. So she laughed and I laughed. And uh, she says, everywhere I go, your name pops up. So I think you and I need to get together. Because everybody used to laugh at me because they said there was much more to treating mental health and addiction than just talk therapy. Talk therapy to me is talking to the software of the brain instead of what ketamine and ibogaine and psilocybin and all these plant medicine, these medicines deal with the hard drive of the brain, which is the subconscious. And that's where all of the stuff is stored that drives the whole system. So I says, oh, that'd be great. So anyway, we worked together for years in the island of St. Kitts, and she did a lot of research. Now, Ibogaine is a very interesting compound. It was used, they did some studies on it uh, for uh, your heart, okay? And it lowers blood pressure, but you have to be very careful with that because you got to see what's on board. You can't have Valiums on board or Xanax or anything like that on board when you're detoxing people from opiates and alcohol. Even though cocaine doesn't need a detox, it's a different type of detox. Now you're detoxing somebody psychologically, not just physically and medically. So the way we used to do it, which was really interesting. Anyway, treatment was two weeks on the island, not just seven days in a detox center. I don't even know why they call it detox, to be honest with you. It's just like a detox means to detoxify, number one. And we're putting other toxins in, you know. Right. So that didn't make much sense to me. But anyway, and people would come out and they would relapse because as they come out, they were still high or kind of high. Let's put it that way. Their brain wasn't functioning. I'll put it this simply. So Hold on one I second, think, uh, Dr. John. I'm hearing yes. uh, kind of a tapping sound throughout. I'm not sure what that is. Oh, okay. I know what it is. It was my ring. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Sorry about I that. heard it was like going, well, where is that coming from? Okay. Thank you so much. I, I wanted to leave stop at a good point. So uh, go ahead and take a, just a quick pause and then just continue. Thanks so much. Okay. So what the way Dr. Uh, Nash did the treatment was really medically sound and spiritually fit. And what do I mean by that? Well, before they went to the island of St. Kitts, I would have them put a 24-hour heart monitor on them, not just an EKG, which is only a snapshot. We wanted the 24 hours to see which really how the functionality of their heart was, as best we could, of course. Then we did a toxicology test because we had to see what was on board. And we did blood work and we did a little psychological profile with them to see if they were appropriate for treatment. Um, people that had schizophrenia, disassociate disorders uh, were kind of like a rule out. There were certain cases that it, they could possibly do it. Uh, it all depends on the interaction we had with the therapist and the psychiatrist. So we would then I would take them and I would go to the island of St. Kitts with them, which was a heck of a journey. You, heard, you ever try to corral 14 addicts at the same time? It was the <laughs> most interesting journey on a flight that you can ever see. And they're all they're all stoned. They're not, you know, they're like they're, this is the last hurrah for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I get into the island, and then of course we would again do a toxicology test on them. Then we would do an EKG on them. 
Uh, we do blood work all over again. And of course, then we would do uh, pre, before they went into their journey. I, my job was to give them their intention, see what they wanted to accomplish, where did they want to go with their life, um, explain to them about Ibogaine and what it does. Now, Ibogaine, compared to the other plant medicines, the way I understand it, is on top of the food chain. You have Ibogaine, and then you have Ayahuasca, you have San Pedro, you have all these other psilocybin. There's a lot of plant medicines that I believe the creator put on this planet to help us heal, not to party with, which I party with every known psychedelic <laughs> known to man. So I'm not saying I didn't. Okay, some trips were good, some trips were not too good. But, you know, and that's what it did. You know, I, I'm a guy from the 60s. So that's what we did back then. Okay. And um, so what I began, it's a really interesting compound. You you really go on this journey for anywhere from 8 to 12 hours, depending if you're a fast metabolizer, slow metabolizer, and how your liver was functioning. So it was a heck of a journey. So, but what we did... Uh, Pre, before they went into the journey, besides all the blood work and all the medical stuff, all right, as they go into the room where they're going to go on this journey, they had beautiful plants and flowers and, you know, something like we had in the ketamine clinic to make them feel like they're part of the, the earth, not in a medical facility, even though we were doing it medically. What I mean by medically is we had a heart monitor on them. We had an IV in their arm in case there was any kind of event. They had eye shades on and they had a headset on with music. And what we also did is we put aroma therapy with them. We found out which scent they liked the best. And we gave them some aroma therapy. So like lavender or vanilla, whatever they choose. All right, because there's only one node to the brain. And what happens is, is that after their journey, months later, they do that, that aroma they would bring back part of their journey, just like the music would bring back part of their journey, which was very interesting how the brain stores information. We would also put them on amino acid formula. We also would put them on probiotics and prebiotics. Okay. So in other words, we're treating the whole person. And I think that's what the psychedelic industry is missing, but I'll go into that after I go into the Ibogaine journey. So what we would do is now we set the stage they're in the bed. They have all this stuff on them. They had a nurse by their bed. We would give them a test dose. We would see how they tolerate. We would wait 45 minutes. Okay, if they tolerated it, then we would give them a full dose. Then they would go through their journey. And it was really interesting because what happens when you go into the subconscious, just like with ketamine or ayahuasca or anything like that, information is put in there in pieces. And some of those pieces you may or may not understand. You may see just darkness. You may see nothing. You may see colors. You may see an ear and in the darkness. You may see music or your grandfather, your mother, or other things that go on there. But the information is not coherent. So what you have to do is you need somebody to help you to extrapolate out all this information to see if it makes sense to you in your current life situation. And usually it does. And they go, wow, I never remembered that. Well, now I remember this. And when they, we also encourage them, just like we do at the Kennedy Clinic, to journal. Journaling accesses a different part of your brain. It's so important, okay? See, with the Kennedy Clinic and with the Ibogaine Clinic, we didn't want short-term success and long-term failure. We wanted people to have long-term success. And that's so important. Too many people, too many clinics are, are selling these medicines as a, a, a magic bullet. It's not. You need to do the work. It took years to get sick, and it takes some time to get well. And it's so important that you do that. My son almost died from this disease. I almost died, and my wife. So to me, this is not a joke. This is serious. You want to go make money, go sell drugs. Leave these drugs alone to help people, these medicines. So I began 
has a bad rap in a sense, and why? Well, it's real simple, just like ketamine had one. Because they use it as a club drug and they use it, uh, you know, what they call a, a K-hole and all of this stuff that we do when you just want to abuse this beautiful, beautiful substances to help you to become all that you can be. And Ibogaine is not something you want to use all the time, I promise you, because you're going to go into those places that you don't want to go, but you need to go. That's so a big commitment. <laughs> Excuse eight, me? That's an eight to 12 hour commitment. So that's not just for a, oh, a yeah. good time. And, no, <laughs> no, no. And you know, it, you know, it's interesting. Most people don't realize it's a schedule one drug. That's why we can't use it in the United States. And the funny part of it is that one of the, the criteria for schedule one is that it's highly addictive. I promise you, you do not want to do this on a daily basis. <laughs> if you want to visit hell on a daily basis, then you have to go to a better psychiatrist. Exactly. Okay? Because that's nothing, something you don't want to do. When you were saying about doing a test dose, what are you looking for? And is it, is it something that, um, like, what are, what are you observing in the patients for that test? Well, dose? an adverse response uh, medically, the heart, anything like that also. Um, you're looking for the way uh, their affect and how they are tolerating it. Okay. And then you put them into the journey and that's the best you can do. So we check the heart monitor, we check the blood pressure, we're checking everything to make sure that the patient is stable to go into the journey. And that's and everything beautiful. she did was the way yeah. it's supposed to, I believe the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. And I want to emphasize uh, that because it's so important with that. I mean, there are people that, and that's why another reason why Ibogaine has a bad name and is because of the cardiac deaths that has have occurred. Um, You know, you can't just go anywhere and just do Ibogaine and trust that it's going to be okay. You do need a clearance. You do need to make sure your heart is okay. You may think your heart's fine because if you just sit on your couch all day, you know, addicted and, you know, doing heroin and what other drugs, you may not know that your heart is in heart failure, especially depending on how much cocaine you do or other substances you can have heart failure unknowingly, right? Or on medications. uh, Especially addicts. And people are depressed. So people are depressed, they don't eat. They don't drink enough water. They They don't take nutrients. They don't exercise. I mean, they're spiritually bankrupt, mentally bankrupt. I mean, they're on, uh, on the edge, always on the edge. So they, how can they help be good? You know, yeah. then you got genetics plays a part and you got all kinds of family histories and all kinds of things. So the reason why ambigain has got a bad rap and psychedelic medicines have a bad rap and same with ketamine. Okay. Why? Because it was, it's been used in non safe places like for instance, like you can't do Ibogaine alone. You do Ibogaine alone. You're supposed to take a, a gun, put some bullets in, spin it, and play Russian roulette with your head because that's what you're doing. Just like you alluded to about medical conditions that you may or may not know. Now, Ibogaine is the most that I've done Ibogaine. On the, not because I was a heroin addict. I did it because my son actually had severe anxiety. He couldn't even get on the plane. So I taught him meditation. I taught him how to calm his breathing. I got him on the plane. We got we went down and I said, you know what? I've been treating people with Ibogaine for years. Okay, but I've never done Ibogaine myself. So it's very, I was able to talk with them about it, but it was, you know, it's like reading a book on football, but never playing football and say, you know, the game. I mean, you, you know about the game. Okay. So that's why I've done ketamine and the situation, the way we're doing it there for uh, to, to make ourselves more spiritually fit and to come to some of our, our insecurities. We all have them. I don't care who you are, what you want to call yourself. We all have all these things in us from my history. And, you know, when you do it in the right vein, you really, really grow like beyond your wildest dreams. That's all I can say to you. And, so what happened with Ibogaine, people were giving to them in hotel rooms, leaving them alone, not checking what's on board. Okay, so 
some people died. And now it wasn't directly because of Ibogaine, it was because of what they had. They had remember, people that do Ibogaine, especially the people that came to West Sunny Island, they were desperate. They everything they did, they went to treatment centers 20 times, they did this, they did that. This was their last journey, as far as they were concerned. And, you know, so, I mean, addicts are funny. I tell you a quick little funny story. You know, when the addicts used to come to the island, they all used to hide their drugs. Because the last hurrah, addicts like to do their last hurrah before they get clean, or attempt to get clean, let's put it that way. So, we would search them, we would find most of it, but they, addicts are very inventive. They're really ingenious in hiding things, all right? One guy hid his, 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 um, his heroin in a plug that was attached to his computer. Uh, I mean, crazy stuff. So what I did was I asked the nurses, I said, does anybody have a dog? They said, yeah, I have a dog. I said, bring the dog. So he had the dog come to the center where we landed with the plane and we're having lunch and we, we have all these suitcases there on the floor and stuff like that. So I got up and I said, look, this is the island drug dog. If this dog, the dog wasn't a drug dog, the dog looked like <laughs> a old dog. You know, you ever see an island dog the way they look? So it was like comical. So I said, and they go, that's not a drug dog. I said, let me tell you something. If this dog finds drugs in your suitcase, you ever spend jail in the island jail, you're not going to like it. So I scared them a little bit, right? So I had the dog walk around with the suitcases. And one day I thought he was going to urinate on the suitcase. <laughs> Stop. But it so happened, the suitcase he stopped on, the guy had hidden drugs inside the lining of the suitcase. He says, oh, I got drugs in there. Let me give it to you, please. <laughs> so, <laughs> the nurses that had run to the bathroom, they were peeing in their pants. I mean, like, laughing so hard. The place was hysterical. You know, that, those are some of the crazy stuff, you know, what, what went on in the island. They put a goat in my room once. I woke up with a goat next to my bed. Um, we had a lot of fun, but we also did a lot of good work. And then after their journey and I began, my job would be post to do therapy with them. And then we would have, uh, we had a sweat lodge. We had uh, spiritual groups and we're calling Mother Ray Boga to help us to understand our journey in life. And it was a really cool treatment center that went on for about 13, 14 years. And I would take them from the island. The hardest thing was when I began was everybody thought, not everybody, but a lot of people thought they were cured. That, oh, I got it now. And a lot of them quit smoking also with this drug, this uh, medicine. And um, we had to talk them into going to treatment. That was my job. So they would come to my treatment center and they would stay there for sometimes 45, 60 days. Okay, sometimes we would scholarship them anyway. You know, some of these kids that really wanted help and the insurance only covers like 30, 28 days. And if it's mental health, they might cover some more, you know? It all depends how you chart. That's another story. Um, and it was, uh, it was an incredible journey with Ibogaine. So this is what Ibogaine does for those who are desperate. And even if you're not desperate, it really works extremely well with opiates and alcohol and cocaine and things like that. Um, all I could say is this, we had unbelievable recovery rates with people that that I began. Because regular detox centers, they put you on Suboxone for five, six days, or they try to keep you on Suboxone. And guess what? Suboxone's an opioid. I mean, yeah. so we're switching seats on the Titanic. Um, now, I'm not against anything that works. For some people, a very small, narrow group of people, yeah. They need to be on that maybe, okay? Or they're going to die because they don't really want help. No matter what you do with them, they just consistently don't want help or they haven't found their path yet. So those are the people that need that. But I want to bring up something for your audience. We're not looking at people comprehensively, number one. What are the co-contributing factors to addiction and mental health? We're not looking at it. If you have closed head injury, it can cause behavioral problems, depression and anxiety and suicidal ideation. As football players, guys coming back from concussions, TBI cases, traumatic brain injury cases, gut issues, 
Guts the second brain. I've been talking about that for 20 something years. Everybody used to laugh at me. Yeah, go to Giordano with his gut now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now all you hear is, oh, the guts, the second brain. Oh, you know, all of this stuff. It is. All right. That bacteria, when it's out of balance, you have to remember something causes inflammation. Inflammation is a killer for us. Also, what happens is when you, what most people don't realize, you have more neurons in your gut than in your brain. Look it up, guys. I don't want anybody to believe me. No, it's Please, true. Actually, it serotonin, you know, that SSRI is the that. number one antidepressant. We have serotonin. 10% of all our serotonin is in our brain. 90% is in the gut. That's that right. is why there's so many side effects when people are on SSRIs, GI side effects. You know, right. I really love how you talk about the holistic part, because that's, what's so important. And, and it's interesting because in the back of my mind, I always thought, oh, I began this magic, you know, you're, you're clear with, um, you know, your addiction and you can go back, but you can't just go back to your home. There's reasons why you became addicted in the first place, your environment, your coping mechanisms, the traumas, family. the family, right. You, you can come off of the drugs and be, and it's beautiful. I began really works through and, and clears, you know, that addiction helps to reset the dopamine receptors and really just like, just release all the, the, um, those addictions in that, in that mind, in the brain. And, but you do have to heal them completely. You have to heal the reason when they go home. Otherwise they'll find themselves back in that space. Absolutely. See, we give them an after, we gave them an aftercare plan. Okay. It look, exercise is very important. If somebody has a heart attack, they want them to exercise after they get out of recovery. Why? The body's meant to move. It's not meant to sit still. Number one. Do you transition okay. them into like a, the 12 step program when you, when they come home? We don't push them into anything. We okay. suggest it to them. This is their healing, not ours. If, if church works for them, I tell them go to church. I don't care what they want to do. If they don't believe in God, fine. Okay. Believe in something, a uh, power greater than yourself. Because I learned one thing with addicts or with people in general. First of all, people don't believe anything you tell them. That's number one. Most of the people. Number two, uh, if you tell people to go left, they, usually they want to go right. Nobody likes to be told what to do. Right. So, right. So, you know, Thank it's you. real simple stuff. You just say, hey, look, this is what we found to work for people. If you choose, I would suggest you do this. If it doesn't work for you, don't do it. It's real simple. But I ask them one question. How's your work working for you? Oh, not too good. Oh, I think maybe you should try something you don't think is going to work. That might work. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, all I can say is this. Look, I love helping people just like you. And, and that's why I fell in love with Sonia and our team because they really care. And man, you know, a lot of clinicians do care, but the, the administration is the one that runs the boat. But guess what? We're the administration too. So we got controls over both ends of the stick. And in most treatment centers, a lot of therapists, they just, they don't know what to do. They just keep doing their job and uh, get their paycheck. And, you know, these treatment centers, unfortunately, a lot of them are warehouses. They're not helping people with mental health issues. We have such a serious epidemic in this country. And we still, I can't understand it, which, but I do. We keep treating people the same way. Let's talk to the thyroid. Oh, wait a while, talking to the thyroid. How about the brain injury? Let's talk to that too while we're at. No, let's talk to the gut. But well, keep talking to it. Let me know how well you do. That's we the thing that blows it. my mind is psychiatry is the only medical profession that doesn't look at the organ that they treat. That's right. That's exactly right. What if and they have that traumatic brain injury? What if they've had a concussion? You were a kid, you fell off your bike, you hit your head, you didn't think anything. Right. But that could have, and then all of a sudden behavior changes started or you never realize you know, why don't we look at a functional brain scan? That's Take why we do hyperbaric medicine at my treatment center. Everybody says, yeah. what? That's oxygen under pressure. Oxygen under pressure turns into a medicine and it helps to heal the brain. Damaged brain cells, believe it or not, even if those damage has been there for 10 years. It's a lot of research on it, but yeah. we're not doing it. Oh, why? Oh, the insurance company doesn't pay. Well, you know what the insurance company, if they ever really got their head out of their the sand, <laughs> all right, 
they would say, you know what? It's costing us a ton of money because it's so stupid what they do. First of all, if you go, Sonia, if you went to my treatment center for 30 days, you came out, two weeks later, you relapsed, and now you go to somebody else's treatment center. And a month later, you relapse, and then you go to somebody, and you keep making this daisy chain of a journey. I wonder how much that would really cost the insurance companies. Now, if you look at it, see, it should be a 60 to 90 day treatment. First of all, the brain's got to heal in each time, number one. Okay. And a five year aftercare program. So now why did I come up with that? Well, there is a program that does that. They have a 90% recovery rate. Oh, really? What program is that? It's called the Physicians Referral Network. That's where doctors get caught with using drugs or they turn themselves in. They have to go to a 90 day inpatient program and then a five year aftercare program where they have to drop urine once a week. Well, wow. how about that? First of all, you have time for your brain to heal. Second of all, you got constant monitoring and support. They have to go to meetings. All right. Well, how about that? And they have the nurses program, as you know. All yes. right. Yeah, I, I think it's called the IPN. Yes. And these are the things we're not learning from. We're not learning from our history. We keep repeating the same things over and over again, expecting different results. That's why at the ketamine clinic, we do integrated therapy included. We do group therapy once a week for as long as they want to come. Bring your family. It's okay because the families sometimes are sicker than the client that we're treating. So we need to get the whole enchilada going. And um, we offer so many things. You know, if you have a deficiencies in nutrients and minerals and vitamins in your body, it can cause depression. Heavy metals cause interruptions in neurotransmission. Your gut issues, we do gut testing, we do micronutrient testing. And now we're starting to do a real cool things once we get it working really well. Yeah. Brain mapping. Now, what is brain mapping? It's called QEEG. What is QEEG? Measure the electrical output of different quadrants in your brain that are deficient. And then we offer neurofeedback also. So to help strengthen those areas in the brain. All of this encompassed with some spirituality encompasses a healthy, wealthy human being. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love it. But I have. Thank you so much for all your work. And thank you for uh, joining us and helping us add in those additional services to really have that holistic approach. Because prior to that, we were just doing, you know, ketamine infusions, integration coaching, and just some vitamin. IV vitamin therapy, but uh, you've definitely uh, transitioned us into a very holistic approach to heal from every avenue. And the NAD plus, NAD is incredible. NAD yes. works with your mitochondria. Your mitochondria is the engine for this, every cell in your body. And it helps yes. to repair those damaged cells. It gives you energy and it has a side note. It helps with depression and anxiety. Wow. Yes. Look at the things that are coming down the plank, guys. And it helps with alcohol addiction, you know, along you with know. the ketamine. But with, with Ibogaine, I love it because you're right. The, the detoxification or pseudo detox is very difficult. It's very punishing for patients. But to be able to experience it with Ibogaine and to be truly detox in 24 hours, that's beautiful. So God gave us an incredible amount of knowledge. We just have to use it and stop worrying all of, always about the money. Look, I'm not against making money. All I could say is this, you need a balance. That's number one. Well, listen, you help one person. People don't realize this. You help a whole family. Yes. And that's so important, man. Yeah. So help my family. Important. Definitely. Thank you so much, John. It was such Thank a pleasure. So and I love here. learning about the Ibogain and the protocol. And hopefully one day with Dr. Dr. Mash, she'll uh, get all the studies done and we'll be able to have treatment centers in the U.S. Well, we're going to see this pandemic. She's going to be at MAPS. She just came back from uh, England. They did what they call the FDA studies there. And uh, she's doing her best to bring it here into the United States. Yeah, oh, beautiful, beautiful. It's very much needed, so... Thank you so much, John. You have a beautiful evening and I look forward to all the other beautiful things we'll do together. Absolutely. Love you, Sonia. Love you too. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you. We're clear. That's a wrap. Awesome.
You're pretty good. Perfect. Everything come out okay? Yeah, doctor, it went great. I know Sonia kind of just let you go and roll with it, and that's good. And, you know, it's good to get the understanding. I mean, hell, we're in South Florida where it's, you know, recovery central. And I know oh, yeah. I have more than enough people that I know of that I've uh, circled around, you know, and if there was more awareness, God, I don't like where, where some of the program is because it's part of the, is in the recovery program. It's that control. It's that constant monitoring and just saying there's got to be some other better way to avoid the whole issue of having to go through 12 steps, having to go through these other things. Remember, there's just a treatment that works and it's not so complicated and not so controlled and not so where people feel like, well, you know, they, they feel an inferiority because I screwed up and now I'm here. I'm mean, going shouldn't feel, no one should feel that way. Well, exactly. you know, I, I tell you, I think it's good. They feel that way. So maybe to get off their butts and do something about it. True. You know, and, and there are no failures in life. There are only lessons. Number one. And, and number two, uh, life is an ongoing journey. It just doesn't, you go to treatment or you get these medicines and you're cured because yeah. life has challenges. And as you get older, you'll see those challenges. And you need the equipment to fight those challenges and the support. Support is really important, whether it's a friend, a sponsor, a priest. I don't care who it is. Okay? We all need support. We all need relationships. Right. Well, also the thing, too, is that if somebody can actually help out, because how many I see that are so young? And if there's a way to get something that can be done to so that the setback is only for – it doesn't go so far late in life where – you know, there's not enough time to reverse the process, reverse course, and, you know, see the second phase of life being much better. We got to start this in kindergarten. How's that? <laughs> wow. I wanted to start, uh, I approached the school system years ago uh, for, um, from uh, fifth grade to eighth grade to do group therapy. Yeah. They didn't want it. Wow. They didn't want it. And I wanted to do family therapy also, bring the families in. I mean, if they're willing to give riddle in the to children at an early age, why not? Then something else. Yeah, well, that's you know, that's it. Give them a pill, shut them up, and move on. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. much our life: is give them a pill. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We came. That's why we need the word out here more. You know, we need more people yeah. to understand this. So. Yeah. That's, that's why, why I'm I, here. I do my best, and Sonia does it best. I, I lecture all over the oh. world about this stuff, and. Listen, oh, I can't man, wait for this to launch. I can't wait for this to launch and for the people to get to hear the good word. All right. I hope they enjoyed it. Absolutely. Yay. Wonderful. Nice meeting you and uh, Sonia. I love you and I'll see you mañana. Yes. Love you too. Yes. Yeah, see you tomorrow. All right. Thanks, okay. guys. All right. Thank Have you. a great evening. Take care. All right. You Bye-bye. too. Bye. Bye. The opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast, republication, or retransmission of this program without proper consent is prohibited.